Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Javier's Philippine Law Lectures for Students. Today, we'll continue with our discussion on the Cooperative Code. And to review, in the last episode, we discussed some incidents that may happen in the midlife cycle of a cooperative. Specifically, division, merger, and consolidation. Now, we will tackle the incidents that take place at the end of the life of a cooperative. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Now let's begin. The last stage of the life of cooperatives involves two topics, namely dissolution and liquidation. Dissolution is the cessation or termination of the juridical personality of the cooperative and this may be accomplished through either of two methods, namely voluntary or involuntary dissolution. As the name suggests, voluntary dissolution is initiated through the will of the cooperative and or its components. And this method has two classes either where creditors are affected or where no creditors are affected. If at the time of dissolution, a cooperative has no creditors or even if it has creditors but the dissolution will not prejudice the rights of such creditors, then the procedure is simple enough. The directors will meet and issue a board resolution dissolving the cooperative and set a general assembly meeting for the members to approve or disapprove the resolution. Now, of course, notice of the meeting must be sent to the members and published for three consecutive weeks in a newspaper, either where the principal office is located or of general circulation. At the meeting, an affirmative vote of at least three-fourths of all the members with voting rights present and constituting a quorum is necessary to approve the resolution dissolving the cooperative. Thereafter, the cooperative can submit the necessary documentary requirements to the Cooperative Development Authority or the CDA, such as the board resolution, affidavit of publication, and certification of the member's approval of the dissolution, among others. Within 30 days, from receipt of the notice of voluntary dissolution from the cooperative, the CDA shall take note shall issue a certificate of dissolution and an order to commence the winding up of affairs. Take note that it is only upon receipt of the certificate of dissolution that the dissolution of the cooperative will take effect and the cooperative shall proceed with the winding up of its affairs. Now, if the dissolution of the cooperative may prejudice the rights of creditors, the procedure is substantially the same, except that after at least three-fourths of all the members with voting rights present and constituting a quorum approve the board resolution dissolving the cooperative at a meeting duly called for the purpose with notice given and published, the cooperative then has to prepare and file a verified petition to dissolve the cooperative with the CDA. So that's the main distinction. Okay, a petition is necessary in case the dissolution may prejudice the rights of creditors. Now, after the receipt of the petition, the CDA will issue an order directing interested third parties to file their objections or their opposition to the dissolution. Now, this order must be published and posted for three weeks. Upon expiry of the period to file objections, the CDA will then proceed with the hearing on the petition. Thereafter, the CDA will issue the order of dissolution setting forth the assets and liabilities of the cooperative, claims of the creditors, and appointment of the board of liquidators, among other matters. When the cooperative receives the order, it can then proceed with the winding up of its affairs. Now, 
As for involuntary dissolution, this refers to the termination of the juridical personality of the cooperative through an appropriate judicial proceeding or by the order of the CDA. Simply, it is dissolution that is not initiated by the cooperative. Now, involuntary dissolution may take place in any of the three following ways. By order of the court, order of the CDA, or by failure of the cooperative to organize and operate. First, a court may order the dissolution of a cooperative on grounds either for violation of any law, regulation, or provision of the bylaws, or for insolvency. Upon receipt of the final and executory decision of the court, the CDA will then issue an order for the cooperative to proceed with the winding up of its affairs. Second, after due notice and hearing, the CDA may suspend or revoke the certificate of registration of a cooperative on any of the following grounds. First, if the cooperative obtained its registration by fraud. Second, if the cooperative exists for an illegal purpose. Third, for willful violation despite notice by the CDA of the provisions of the cooperative code or the bylaws of the cooperative. Fourth, for willful failure to operate on a cooperative basis. And fifth, for failure to meet the required minimum number of members in the cooperative. Last, involuntary dissolution may also take place if either, first, the cooperative has not commenced business and its operation within two years after the issuance of its certificate of registration, or second, if a cooperative has not carried on its business for two consecutive years, in which case the CDA will give the cooperative an opportunity to explain itself through the sending of a formal notice to show cause as to its failure to operate. If the cooperative cannot provide justifiable cause for its failure to operate, then the CDA will delete the cooperative's name from the roster of registered cooperatives and the cooperative will be de deemed dissolved. The final topic in the life cycle of co the cooperatives is liquidation, which is the process of settlement and closure of the cooperative affairs, the disposition, conveyance, and distribution of its assets. Liquidation refers to the various activities undertaken by a dissolved cooperative through a liquidator or the board of liquidators, which activities include making an inventory of assets and liabilities, preserving the assets, converting the assets into cash, paying the creditors, prosecuting and defending suits by or against the cooperative, settling and closing the cooperative affairs, disposing, conveying, and distributing the remaining assets, transferring statutory funds to the intended beneficiaries, and to submit the final report to the CDA. Now, under the law, liquidation will take place in case dissolution happens through the following methods. When its charter expires, when voluntarily dissolved, or when dissolved through an appropriate judicial proceeding. In any of those cases, Article 69 provides that even though dissolved, the cooperative will nevertheless continue to exist for three years after the time it is dissolved. Not to continue the business for which it was established, but for the purpose of prosecuting and defending suits by or against it. It also includes settlement and closure of its affairs, disposition, conveyance, and distribution of its properties and assets. So the cooperative can still file cases or cases can still be filed against it for the collection of debts 
but the cooperative cannot perform any act which will continue its business because it's already dissolved. It is only allowed to perform acts which will settle and wind up its affairs. And how is this winding up done? Generally, if a cooperative is voluntarily dissolved, we follow what is provided for in the bylaws of the cooperative. If there are no bylaws or if the bylaws are inconsistent with the law, then liquidation may either be by the cooperative itself through a board of liquidators elected or appointed by the members of the cooperative or by conveying all cooperative assets to a trustee or trustees who will take charge of the liquidation. In case of involuntary dissolution, winding up activities will be carried out by a liquidator to be appointed by the CDA or the court that ordered dissolution. Now, this board of liquidators, whose members shall not be less than three, but not more than five will be selected or constituted by the board of directors of the cooperative within 60 days from within, uh, within 60 days from receipt of the order of dissolution from the CDA or the court now the law the law provides a long list of qualifications for liquidators which you can read on your own but some of the qualifications include that he must have the time and willingness to undertake winding up. There should be no conflict of interest with the cooperative except for his membership. Technical competence, of course. And he must not be guilty of a crime involving moral turpitude, gross negligence, or gross misconduct. Okay? Definitely, the person to be appointed should not be facing charges involving financial or property accountability because, of course, that person has to be trustworthy. And, of course, these liquidators are entitled to receive compensation in an amount fixed by the cooperative or by the CDA and to be paid out of the funds of the cooperative. Now, in case the directors fail or refuse to constitute the board of liquidators, then at least 25% of the members entitled to vote shall convene and select or appoint the liquidators or trustees. And in case both the board of directors and the members fail, then the liquidators or trustees will be appointed by the CDA. The election or appointment of a liquidator or liquidators shall terminate the power of the board of directors and other committees, meaning they can no longer act on behalf of the cooperative to bind the cooperative. Okay, They cannot bind the cooperative anymore. Now, as I mentioned, the board of liquidators or trustees has several functions and duties including the making of an inventory, preserving the assets and converting them into cash, determining the liabilities, and paying the obligations of the cooperative. Take note that in disposing of and converting the assets into cash, the liquidator must do it in a manner that will maximize the realization of the market value of the assets at the shortest possible time and least cost to the cooperative. As much as possible, assets must be sold in bulk or by lot through public bidding and negotiated sale may be resorted to only if there are no interested bidders or if there was a failure of bidding. Liquidators also have the power to sue and be sued under the name of the cooperative to protect and defend the cooperative's rights and interests. Now, these liquidators have very many functions, responsibilities, and powers, and I will not go through them anymore one by one because they are really very, very many, and time constraints will not permit this. You can read this on your own. However, it must be noted that because of these powers and duties, the liquidators are mandated to post an adequate bond in an amount to be fixed by the CDA to cover the period of liquidation and to be paid out of the funds of the cooperative. Ultimately, 
the liquidators shall be responsible for the speedy, equitable, and beneficial winding up of the affairs of the cooperative. Take note, however, that if during the winding up period, the liquidator finds evidence that the continued existence and operation of the cooperative may be viable and beneficial to its members and other concerned parties, he may request for the lifting of the order of dissolution, unless, of course, the dissolution was at the instance of the cooperative, in which case they cannot be compelled to continue as a cooperative if they no longer want to. Now, in case the liquidators fail to comply or continue its functions or duties at any time within the winding up period, the cooperative is authorized to convey all its properties to trustees for the benefit of its members, creditors, and other persons in interests. After which, all interest with which the cooperative had in those properties will be terminated. But, if the liquidators do their job properly, correctly, then liquidation takes place. So what are the effects of liquidation? The winding up of affairs of a cooperative produces the following results. First, all debts are realized and assets are converted into cash. Second, Debts are settled following the rules of the Civil Code on preference and concurrence of credits or in the following order, government taxes, third-party creditors, employees' compensation, deposit liabilities, preferred shares, then common shares. Third effect, reserves are disposed of in accordance with law and the bylaws of the cooperative. And the fourth, Remaining assets are returned to the members in proportion to their investments. To reiterate and emphasize, during the winding up period, the cooperative can no longer perform acts which will constitute doing which will constitute or continue the doing of business. The only acts it can perform are those necessary to carry out winding up activities, which can generally be classified as conversion of assets to cash, payment of liabilities, disposition of reserve funds, and return to the members of remaining assets. Of course, the CDA may cause the examination of the books of accounts and other financial documents of the cooperative during the winding up period through an independent certified public accountant or CPA. Remember that a cooperative shall only distribute its assets or properties upon lawful dissolution and after payment of all its debts and liabilities, except in the case of decrease of share capital of the cooperative and as otherwise allowed by law. Now, there are certain assets that cannot be distributed to the members, such as the reserve fund, which came from at least 10% of the net surplus, which may instead be distributed to a use of fracturary trust fund to an affiliated federation or union, or to be donated to a community in the area of operation of the cooperative. Another which cannot be distributed to the members is the unexpended balance of the education and training fund, which comes from not more than 10% of the net surplus. This shall be credited to the education and training fund of a chosen union or federation. Further, take note that all studies, donations, legacies, grants, aids, and such other assistance from any local or foreign institutions, whether public or private, shall be subjected to a cheat, meaning it shall revert to the state, okay? Any assets remaining after the payment of the cooperative's obligations to its creditors shall be distributed to the members in payment of their respective share capital. If the remaining assets are not sufficient to pay the full share of the capital contribution of the members, the distribution shall be done in proportion to their capital. 
after the winding up of the affairs of the cooperative, the assets distributable to creditor or member whose whereabouts are unknown or cannot be found shall be first held in trust by the board of liquidators for how long? For a period of five years from receipt. Upon expiry of that period, it will now be given to the federation or union to which the cooperative is affiliated for the purpose of cooperative development. And if not affiliated with any uh, union or federation, the undistributed assets shall be given to the community where the cooperative operated. So on the final day of the winding up period, the liquidators should submit the final report of liquidation, which must be acted upon by the CDA within 30 days from receipt. Thereafter, and within 45 days from receipt of the final report, if the CDA is satisfied that the winding up activities were completed in accordance with law, then it will now issue an order of cancellation of the certificate of registration. The cancellation of registration of a cooperative takes effect immediately upon issuance and this results in the delisting of the name of the cooperative in the cooperative registry and the cessation or termination of the existence of a cooperative as a cooperative body for all intents and purposes. Thus, claims for or against the cooperative will no longer be enforceable, meaning they cannot be enforced in a court of law. Nevertheless, the CDA still has to keep the vital records of the cooperative for five years after issuance of the order or longer in case li the liquidation is a subject of civil, criminal, or administrative proceedings. Now, the CDA has to keep those records to serve as reference to clarify issues and questions which may later arise regarding the operation and liquidation of the cooperative. So, that's it for the end incidents in the life of a cooperative. As for the powers, responsibilities, and composition of cooperatives, we will take those up in future episodes. So I hope you may have picked up a thing or two, and I hope to see you soon, guys. Okay? Bye!